Hey, Blue Ridge, I'm Cammie, and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. I've loved these times of worship together on Sunday mornings online. First Chronicles, I love where it says, sing to the Lord all the earth and declare his salvation day after day. So no matter where you are, your living room, your bedroom, your back porch, wherever you're watching from today, I wanna invite you to join us. Stand to your feet or sit, close your eyes, but just worship God with us together.
That is who you are. You're the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Hey guys, I'm Cami, and we're going to continue in our worship with giving. For those of you who call Blue Ridge home and want to give toward Blue Ridge, you can do that in three ways. You can text to give, you can give online, and you can actually mail a check here to our new London campus. And all of those are detailed on our website at blueridge.org forward slash giving. We also want to remind you of all the opportunities there are for you, even in this season, to get involved with a virtual community. So on our website as well, blueridge.org forward slash virtual communities are groups and different things going on throughout the week on YouTube, on Facebook Live, different ways for you to step into community and stay connected in this season. Speaking of staying connected, we have started up in-person services about a month ago. It has been so encouraging to come together and just be able to look in each other's eyes and see people face to face. And so we wanna invite you, if you haven't already, or if you have, please come to our in-person services, both here at New London and at Bedford. At New London, we ask you please register so that we can just be prepared for everyone who's gonna come. And you can do that online at blueridge.org forward slash reopen. And then for Bedford, we have a 10 a.m. service. It's outside, no registration required. And you guys can check that out at our Westgate Shopping Center campus. You guys can see all the details about registration and location times and addresses at blueridge.org forward slash locations. We have some really exciting news for those of you who have been missing our Be Our Kids community so much. We are gonna be taking the first step toward reopening Be Our Kids on August 2nd. Now this is gonna be for our rising first graders through fifth grade in this first phase of reopening. And it's gonna be here at our new London campus, Sunday morning, August 2nd. There are details about registration, how to make that happen, where to go when you get here, and you can find all of that online on our website, but save the date. And for those of you who have younger children who are looking forward to bringing them back, we are looking forward to welcoming them back sooner than later, but we wanna do this well in a way that honors you, that honors God, and then also honors the restrictions set before us so that people can be safe and comfortable while coming back to be our kids. So this week, we're going to be jumping into a brand new series, and we're really excited about it. You may remember a few weeks ago, we asked you three questions. What is God teaching you? What are you struggling with? And what questions are you finding yourself asking regularly? And so this is the first Sunday of You've Asked For It, and we're going to join Jeremy right now. Patience. Humility slowing down, being alone, isolated, my pride, my fear, the loss of control. Is this the end of time? What does God want from me in this season? How can I find God in the middle of all of this? How come there's so much division and hate? What can I really do about it? Will this ever end? When will we get back to normal? How can I help point people to Christ in the middle of all of this? These themes, statements, questions are a small representation of your answers to the questions we asked just a few weeks ago. The questions that were things like, what has God been teaching you in this last season? What are you struggling with? And what questions have you been asking a lot lately? Now, at the beginning of 2020, we said we felt like this was the year of the disciple. A disciple being someone who is following Jesus, is being made like Jesus, and who is on mission with Jesus. Well, as we've moved in and through these first seven months, I don't think we could have chosen a more important subject for us to wrestle through this year. As following Jesus has become more difficult, 
as I believe God is using the events of this last few months to accelerate who he wants to make us into as his disciples. And as I believe there is a growing opportunity we are being given to join Jesus on his mission of hope in this season of fear and division. So as we continue to unpack what a disciple is and what a disciple does, it seemed good after prayer and conversations. It seemed like it was the perfect opportunity to take what God has already been doing inside of many of us, challenging many of us with, and causing many of us to question and teach how a disciple of Jesus is to respond to these things. So today, we're beginning our new series called You Asked For It, COVID-19 Edition. Normal. That word was a very common word used in your feedback. Things like, when will we get back to normal? Will there be normal again? Will I be able to live life as I did before? Is normal really a thing for us moving forward? When will all this division be over and we can return to some sort of normalcy? Will things ever go back to somewhat normal? Now, let me just say, if there was a question or a theme that resonated with me when I initially looked at the list, it was this one. This whole idea of returning to normal. Will it happen? When will it happen? Can it happen faster, please? See, one big one for me is this next school year for my kids. How normal will it be? How many days will they be going? How many days online versus in person? How normal will their classes feel? Will they have normal lunchtime and normal recesses? How much will be expected of us to do at home? How will this affect the normal rhythm of our family? I'm asking this question when it comes to the church. When will it feel normal again? When will we all be back together in the same place rather than some online and some in the building? When will I be able to stand in the atrium on a Sunday morning drinking some coffee and having a normal conversation? When will groups just be able to meet and solve normal problems rather than pandemic problems? My work week. When can I go back to meeting as normal rather than Zoom and working remotely? See, there's this deep desire and yearning inside of me for normal. But obviously, the trouble with this question is that none of us can tell the future. We have no idea when all of this will be over or if all of this will ever be over. We have our opinions about how serious it is. We have our ideas and thoughts about how our leaders should be leading through this. We have our wants and desires for normalcy. But part of the reason this is such a big question for so many of us is that the fact that no one can really answer it. No one can tell us when or if we will get back to normal. Recently, I saw that the year 536 AD is considered by some, a lot of scholars, a lot of scientists and historians, the worst year in human history to have lived. That's because some very large volcanic eruptions took place. The sun went dark for the better part of 18 months. Imagine that. The average temperature in Europe and China dropped significantly, some say as much as 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So much so that the crops didn't grow, leading to a worldwide shortage on food. There was starvation and disease that killed millions and millions of people. Some scholars and scientists have estimated it took the world a hundred years to recover or to get back to normal from that one year. I think most of us hope that that's not the case here. But the fact is, we just don't know the answer how, to how long this will happen or how long it will be until we return to normal. So I had to take a step back and ask myself, why do I want normal? Why is it so important to me and clearly to us? What does normal represent? Well, the dictionary definition of normal is conforming to a usual standard, typical or expected. See, 
Normal brings with it the feelings of stability, security, clarity, comfort, and ease. And most of us, including myself, like and desire these things. Only as I went down this path, I ran into another problem. It's very rarely that meaningful, significant steps forward in life take place within the boundaries of the norm. Just look at what we celebrate, the stories that inspire us, the things that often bring us hope. They often revolve around people and events that move outside of the norm. And they venture outside of the normal way and find a new, better, more progressive way. In fact, when I lay the lens of normalcy over the Bible, over accounts we share, I share and teach my kids, very rarely do I see normal stability, security, clarity, comfort, or ease come into focus. But still, our struggle and desire for normal is very real and very important. So what do we do? When we want and desire to return to normal, but know that normal rarely leads to a significant, meaningful life, and I would even argue rarely leads to a significant, meaningful relationship with Jesus. So if you have a Bible, would you open it up to the book of Exodus? It's in the Old Testament, or as it's also called the Jewish Scriptures, it's the second book in our Bible. So a quick bit of context that I'm sure some of you are aware of, but some of you who are new to the Bible narrative uh, may not be. See, at the end of Genesis, the first book in the Hebrew Scriptures, we have this Hebrew family, primarily made up of 12 brothers. And the most well-known brother was a man named Joseph, who left the land of Canaan, modern-day Israel, because of famine in the land. And they now lived in Egypt. But before Joseph dies, he says to his brothers that one day God's gonna take them out of this land that they live in in Egypt and back to the land they all came from. Well, this ends up taking over 400 years. And during this 400 years, this family grows until they reach the point where their size threatens the Egyptians. So they're forced into slave labor. Well, at the end of this 400 years, God raises up a deliverer and his name is Moses. And he goes to the Pharaoh at that time and says, you need to let my people go. And you know what Pharaoh says? No. So God brought 10 plagues. And finally, after the 10th plague, the people of Egypt and the Pharaoh say, go, get out of here. We're done with you and the suffering that you and your God are causing us. So the people start out on a journey back to the land of Canaan where their ancestors had once lived, and to become a nation for the very first time. But there's an issue. There's a very large wilderness slash desert between where they've lived in Egypt and the land of Canaan, where God is now leading them. And there are thousands upon thousands of people who have grown up and only known a life of captivity. People who've never known what it is to make their own decisions. People who've never fought in a battle. People who've never governed themselves. Who have never traveled, most likely, anywhere. Who have only heard the stories of this land that God had promised their ancestors. And so along the way, there are some issues that they encounter. So I want to read a series of these issues and see if you can pick up on any themes. So where I wanna start is in Exodus 14. And here in Exodus 14, you have Pharaoh who had to change a heart and now wants the people back. So his army is hunting down the people and the people are caught at the edge of the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army coming behind them. And we start reading in verse 10. It says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us to bring us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Now, I know that those of us who are familiar with this account know that God does something miraculous next. And we know that God, 
through Moses, divides the water, and the, peop- and the people walk across on dry land, safely reaching the other side. And when Pharaoh's army crosses the water, what ends up happening? The water collapses, and all of Pharaoh's fighting men, including Pharaoh himself, are killed. And these Israelites didn't have to raise one sword, not to, that they even had one to raise anyway. Next, we see in Exodus chapter 15, another episode, another challenge. It says, Then Moses, in verse 22, led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. So this is a long time to be in a desert with thousands of people and have no water. Verse 23, When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. So they seemed like they had found water, but they were only disappointed to find it, was, it wasn't fit for drinking. Verse 24, so the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Thousands of people in the middle of the wilderness, no water for three days. Seems like something I would have gotten cranky about also. But what does God do? Verse 25, it says this, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. God miraculously cleaned the water, making it safe to drink. Fast forward to the next chapter, chapter 16, and we read this. Verse 2, in the desert, the the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There, at least, we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out in this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Translation, yes, we were captive in Egypt, but at least we had food. So what happens God provides them miraculously with food from heaven, stuff they called manna, which was this sort of flaky bread, and meat from quail. And finally, we turn over to Exodus 17, and we read this. It says, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Again, no water. But this time God uses Moses' staff to bring water from a rock. So did you notice any themes? You see, when studying the Bible, themes are always important. So what did you see? Lots of needs, right? (laughs) Which makes sense. A lot of people, lots of needs. Another theme, they seem to like to grumble, right? (laughs) But let's not be too harsh on them. I'm sure if I was being hunted by an army, no water, for days, multiple times that happening, no food, going to someplace you've never been. In fact, probably you have no idea how long this is gonna take you to get there. I'm sure I would have been grumbling also. Other things, themes may have been God's miraculously providing for their needs. But one theme that I saw over and over again, something that I believe is important for our discussion about normal, was their desire to go back to Egypt to go back to what they knew, what was comfortable, what was normal. Now, at first blush, this doesn't make sense to me at all. Hundreds of years of forced labor, no freedom, work to death, and you're free now. And you want to go back? You wish you were back there? You wonder why you're even out here? It doesn't make sense until I overlay my own discomfort in this season my own desire to return to what I knew before these last handful of months. And then I start to understand a little bit about why they wanted to return to Egypt. You see, Egypt represented what they knew as normal. And although it was less than ideal, that's all they had ever known. It was predictable. There was clarity each day they woke up. 
There was this weird sense of security in a life that was familiar. They had, much like us, been ripped from their norm, and now each day was unpredictable. Each day they felt a little more out of control. It was uncomfortable. And as odd as it sounds, they wanted to go back to what was the norm. They desired to return to Egypt. And this just points out how powerful the pull to whatever or however we define normal can be. But here's the issue. God wasn't back in Egypt. God wasn't in what they felt was normal. God wasn't in their predictable days. God was in the desert with them, represented by that cloud by day and that fire by night. God was in the continual disruption of their norm. God was in the uncomfortable places they were being led. God was in the place that they were trying to escape. So before we take this any further this week, I wanna stop and ask the question, as we sit here in this similar place that they found themselves, and before we rush back to what was normal, can we examine what returning to normal may mean? Can we look at what may be lurking in the shadows of our comfort? Could we ask ourselves, could we ask God, was there captivity in my comfort? See, at the end of the day, the people were willing to sacrifice the new thing that God was doing, the new life that he was inviting them to move into, to return to their comfortable captivity. Though in reality, it was anything but comfortable. It was just normal. Now we get the gift of looking at their life from the perspective of a few thousand years removed. Well, maybe for us, if we could just imagine a few thousand years from now, if someone had the ability to read about these disruptions in our lives and how we would respond, would they be shocked by how we were trying to leave where God was leading? Even though it was uncomfortable and returning to the captivity in the pursuit of the comfortable? Could it be that God may be giving us a gift to experience something new, some new freedom in him because of this season? Where was their captivity in my comfort? I mean, maybe for you, it was in your schedule. Before all of this, the nights you were out running from one thing to another, it's what you knew, it was normal, but in reality, you were captive to an overfilled schedule, distracting you from the things that God was inviting you into. Maybe it was as silly as the sound, the comfort of eating out a lot. Maybe literally and figuratively, you were captive to what filled your stomach and what pleased you, but now God is leading you into uncomfortable places of leveraging and using those same resources you used to use to please yourself for the sake of someone else. Maybe it was a school you were going to be a slave to for years because of the debt you would incur. And this disruption came at just the right time. And now God is leading you to in maybe a completely different direction. Maybe like myself, you were held captive by the comfort of your own ignorance on things like racism. And like me, this whole disruption has caused you to re-examine, to listen, and to educate yourself. So here's our application. Each day in your chair time, that is specific time set aside to be with Jesus, before you rush back to what was once normal, maybe God is giving us a gift in the discomfort. Maybe in this season, there is a grace he's extending to us. Maybe he's setting us up to free us from some previous places of captivity. Would you be willing to ask Jesus the simple question, where was their captivity in my comfort? And here's the second part. Would you ask someone who knows you well the same question? Someone who will tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. Where is their comfort or where was their comfort in my captivity? Next week, we're gonna look at part two in this return to normal. And we're gonna look at how we can remain with God even when it's extremely uncomfortable.
so much for joining us today. We hope you'll join us next week as we continue in our new series, You've Asked For It. Have a great week.